just a message on the chat to confirm that the voice is okay alaikum salam it's good is yeah okay thank you a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim الحمد لله سبحان الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسلنا ربنا بالحق قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت عليم حكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي وفرض امري الى الله بصير بالعباد الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين بالقاسم محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذي اذهب الله عنكم الرجس اهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليكم ايفري ون ام ويلكم تو اور سيشن ان اوف فور قران تفسير ذس از ناو اور ثرد سيشن ان تو سوره فاتحه بت تو سبيك فيرلي Uh, we are still on bismillah rahman rahim and we're still discussing allah's uh, beautiful names rahman and rahim and uh, so uh, today session we move forward for the last two sessions we've been discussing love we've been discussing uh, how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be felt through the faculty of heart uh but cannot be made sense of through the rational mind that is why the journey of the mystic is from the brain to the heart and uh, the, i was talking to my teacher during the week and uh, he mentioned something he said that well mystics don't make sense because they uh, don't have a logic to what they do they're very spontaneous um and uh, we were discussing how imam hussein alayhi uh, salam in the plains of karbala he uh, when he met with his army uh and he was with the entire family he was with women and children and we see that whatever water he had he gives it away to the extent that he wants even the horses of the army of the enemy to be completely satisfied and satiated um and he doesn't want anyone to go without the water knowing that he was with his family knowing he was with his children um knowing that he was um uh in a desert and he was in dangerous uh situation he was still uh giving this water away now from the point of view of uh you know our uh, logic and rationale we would be like well a sensible person should at least keep some for his family and a sensible person would at least be a little calculated and not just give it all away um so in some sense uh, what imam hussein did would look like it was a very careless act like how can you how can you prioritize the horses of your enemies over even your own children and family it doesn't make sense but we see that what um uh my uh, but but the thing is that what imam hussein was actually doing was that he was following his heart in the moment right he was in the moment he was following his heart he had full tawakkul and so tawakkul can look like madness sometimes tawakkul can look like being crazy sometimes um tawakkul can look like jumping off a cliff and not knowing where you're going to land so um fear is a part of this journey because when you want to decide that okay i want to give up everything in my way for god and i my aim and my maqsad and my you know my entire uh focus is on finding god and reaching him then uh sometimes you uh, you have to be gripped in fear um and uh, a lot of mystics have written about the journey through fear um but it's always uh, about uh, letting go and uh, jumping in ju- diving right in so uh so this was the 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 prelude i wanted to give for today's session and so uh we're talking about love and faith 
uh, versus fear. Um, and so on this path of love and faith, fear will be our very regular uh, visitor. Uh, fear will keep coming. Uh, it will visit us and we have to find our inner strength and inner light of faith uh, coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to overcome it sometimes moment to moment. Um, and even thinking about the very next moment can again grip us with fear. So with Allah's mercy enveloping us with discussion into Rahman and Rahim, I would like to discuss Hazrat Ibrahim's jump into fire. What was it that enabled him to jump into fire even when it, we hear a hadith that Hazrat Jibreel came to him and said, would you like me to save you? Um, and he says, did you come, uh, you know, with the direct order of God? And he says, no, I wanted to come and help, so I've come. And he says, no, I have my full faith in what Allah has destined for me. Because uh, to those whose eyes of the heart open up, they know that Allah has a bigger plan. They don't get uh, caught up in the, uh, you know, the smaller or visions, they, they have a bird's eye view. And so for them, the plan Allah has is sweeter and far better and more perfect than the pains and the, and the uh, calamities of life. So what was that love that Hazrat Ibrahim had? And Hazrat Ibrahim's love is a complete manifestation of his good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that I am so loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there is no way that he will ever let any harm come to my soul. If I die in this fire, that is good for my soul because Allah loves me and his love dictates that he will never let any harm come to me. And whatever he has planned for me, even if it's, uh, you know, that I won't get burned or whatever plan, he didn't know, right, that Allah was going to save him. Uh, whatever it is, Allah knows best. Allah is the, is the wisest, Allah is the most loving. So sometimes uh, if we believe that somebody is really wise and rational, then in their calculation, they can become ruthless. That they can become uh, unkind and be just, you know, they can do the right and the wrong. And the human being, being a lump of flaws, being so shallow and low in their own capacities, knowing how imperfect we are, a human being, if uh, is relying on a God of calculation, a God of, you know, right and wrong constantly, or a God of uh, heaven and hell, uh, then that human being would not be able to dare to jump into fire because they know that they're imperfect. And if I am imperfect and I know that my God is very calculated, I will never be able to make mistakes I will never be able to jump. I will never be able to take that leap of faith. Uh, it will be a very constrictive, a very uh, a choking kind of a life where your God is constantly keeping tabs on you and your imperfections. And um, that would cause a lot of internal damage psychologically as well because we won't be able to get out of uh, our little uh, tiny circles. And human beings are supposed to find their beingness out of their humanness. And their beingness can only come if they rely on the ultimate being. And relying on the ultimate being means to understand how loving that entity is. Because love gives us the wings of uh, faith that enable us to jump from the cliff. Because uh, otherwise we can't, right? Because we'd be scared. So that was Husni Zan Billah, having good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, the names of Allah Rahman and Rahim that we discussed uh, last week in a lot of detail, um, I had long ago taught this, I think, to children even, that um, if we could imagine that Allah's Rahim, that Allah's mercy, is like a pair of glasses that we, we wear, okay? like sunglasses and uh, and then difficulties come in our life and if we can put on those glasses and then look at it we put on the lenses of god's mercy 
we put on the lenses of God's uh, good opinion that he is Rahman. And then we look at it, then sometimes uh, we'll, the perspective will change and we will find goodness in there that we had discussed last week also. I gave the example of Oprah. So, um, uh, so this is how uh, we look at Allah SWT as Rahmani, always in action, always working. And we had said that it never stops. Now, Dr. Wayne Dyer actually, uh, uh, you know, he quotes this ayat of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all good is from me and evil is from you, right? And uh, a lot of times we get gripped in fear because we feel that we are evil or we did something wrong. And because I'm not a good person, now I deserve punishment or I deserve uh, bad things in life. Uh, and we, we go into that spiral of self-blame and um, those kind of thoughts. And uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer says that if, uh, you know, in the Quran, Allah says that, so, so he's quoted it in one of his talks, and I really enjoyed listening to the way he explained it. And then I have my own spin to it. And uh, he says that if, 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 God, if good is from God, and everything is from God, then everything must be good. So God is saying all good is from me and evil is from you. But we do know that everything is from God. And if everything is from God, then everything must be good. And therefore, even though calamities and traumas that we see around us and the pains in life that we see around us, they, uh, you know, they paralyze us sometimes. They, uh, you know, give us a lot of heartbreak. But eventually in the world of the soul, the, the rub is a sculptor who's constantly sculpting our heart. So that work never stops. And that's why all is, all is good. Whatever the body, the mind, the body in the physical world uh, perceives as painful and bad and hurtful and unjust sometimes, it is in the realm of the soul never going wrong. So um, there's an ayah in the Holy Quran that I really wanted to share today from Surah Yusuf, ayah number 21. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wallahu ghalibu ala amri walakin aksar al-nasi la ya'lamun. And Allah is predominant over his affair, but most people do not know. So this is the subject of today's talk, actually. Uh, this is the perspective in which we're going to be looking at love, that Allah is predominant over all affairs. So all good is from God and everything is from God. So everything is good and everything is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Allah ghalib. He is ghalib ala amrihi. Like he is predominant over all affairs. And so um, uh, what I want to uh, uh, go into now is the tafsir of uh, Surah Fatiha, which I will be doing faster today. Uh, we'll do the breakup uh, in the coming classes too. But I, as I had promised that I would like to uh, go through Surah Fatiha in a brief way, a little fast, so that when we do it in our Salah, we can uh, connect to um, Surah Fatiha in our Salah in a way that we feel some sort of transformation or replenishment uh, for the day. Uh, so... Um, so this is our topic that Allah is predominant. Now, um, in my classes with my teacher, uh, when we were doing philosophy, um, you know, uh, the discussion about uh, free will and destination keeps coming up again and again. And uh, one of the scholars I met said, uh, Fatma, don't go into this discussion because this can only be understood when you cross the threshold of um, the mind. Uh, and you enter the other dimension, only then you can understand it because this discussion is from the, uh, you know, the, this is God's answer. You, you won't be able to understand it unless, you know, you, you've passed that threshold. So I understand uh, that sometimes discussing uh, uh, free will and destination and, you know, saying that is Allah predominant over everything or do we have free will? Uh, can take us into very unnecessary circles and arguments for no, with no fruit, uh, very unfruitful discussion sometimes. So that's not the aim today um, at all. The aim is to look at 
the the Rahmania of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the Fatiha with two uh, perspectives. The first perspective is saying, okay, I do have free will um, partially. And then what is Surah Fatiha saying to me? And then saying that Allah is the ghalib one. Allah is predominant over my affairs. So uh, I want to discuss that. Now, before I go into that, um, as you can see on the screen, that I want to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, uh, Yusuf and Bibi uh, Zulekha. It is really interesting how Allah puts these talks together that um, I had already decided to talk about Hazrat Zulekha like for two weeks, I've been planning to discuss it. But in today's session, uh, the ayat that we just discussed about the pre-domination uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over his affairs is also from Surah Yusuf and we're also discussing um, the story of Hazrat Zulekha. So Allah works in these really beautiful ways. Um, so what I want to share with you about Bibi Zulekha is from the book, um, The Tao of Islam um, by Sachiko Morata. And it's a beautiful book uh, to discuss, uh, to, to, to read. Um, uh, and uh, what she discusses, uh, so there's a forward to this book, Tao of Islam by Anne-Marie Chamel, Ch Chamelia. Anne Marie Shimel, and she's a, a professor at Harvard University in Islamic Sciences, I think. A very well known name in the world of philosophy and mysticism. And she says, uh, I'm reading this out, uh, she says in the foreword that she's given that um, the concept of the woman's soul has enriched Islamic literature. Its most famous representative is the figure of Zulekha, who consumed herself in her love for the paragon of beauty, Yusuf. She was purified through long years of suffering to become, as one might say, the nafs e lavama, the blaming soul. And finally, she was united with her lost beloved as nafs e mutmaina, the soul at peace. The reason I loved this analogy so much is because Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran uh, that everywhere you look are my signs and everywhere you turn uh, is the face of God. And, uh, you know, for us, the messages in Quran, as we've discussed, are for every moment. And so it's the, so the, the story of Hazrat Zulekha it has its own signs. And uh, the way Anne-Marie is explaining over here is that there is a transformation and there is a metamorphosis of uh, Bibi Zulekha's soul. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know which surah we were doing um, it said that insan is in a state of kabad. Insan is in a state of suffering, constantly toiling, constantly toiling. This toiling doesn't stop. And so uh, uh, Bibi Zulekha, uh, you know, fell in love with Hazrat Yusuf. And that is the story of the beloved. And these are, these are like, uh, like store, signposts. These are analogies or, uh, you know, they're metaphors of our soul's journey. And so... Um, Hazrat Yusuf uh, denotes the beloved and, uh, you know, it is the hardwired, uh, you know, human nature uh, in our yearning for beauty is our yearning for perfection. And we are all eventually yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are all striving for perfection. And Hazrat Yusuf salam, denotes that perfection that Bibi Zulekha saw. And so in this love story of, uh, you know, uh, of Hazrat Zulekha, we see that her uh, nafs, her nafs e amara, the, the, the lowest level, which was desirous, which was the animal soul, uh, how, how this desire takes her on a journey to eventually meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She, uh, she is uh, described in the Quran and... Uh, we see that Bibi Zulekha uh, goes through this apparent uh, transformation that, that her old body becomes new. There was an alchemy, the healing, there was change. There was not just an inner uh, change, but Allah is saying that anything is possible for me. And uh, there are so many discussions about how when the soul transforms, the body also transforms. And we had a whole discussion about healing and all of that. But Bibi Zulekha stands out not because, you know, as a child, uh, it used to be so confusing that should I call Bibi Zulekha with Hadrat Bibi Zulekha or should I talk to 
to talk about her as Zulekha, the, the sinner. Uh, and it's so interesting that, you know, um, as we grow up, we understand that without that sin, without that journey, there could not have been the Zulekha in the end who became Bibi Zulekha, the one with, who Allah respects so much. So, so that is the journey of insan, the kabat, you know, we, we cannot find light without the dark. And uh, Bibi Zulekha then becomes a complete uh, representation of the journey of the soul from Nafsi Ammara to Nafsi Mutmainna, right? And so um, what we see is that in the yearning of the beloved Zulekha toils, the state of kabad, and the pain of uniting with the beloved breaks her heart again and again and again. And that yearning keeps her going until she unites uh, with her beloved. But, but now, uh, you know, if, if any of you have seen uh, the series on Hadrat Yusuf uh, that the <clears throat> television had made, uh, and when they show the union, they say they show how Bibi Zulekha is not interested in the immediate, uh, you know, meeting with Hazrat Yusuf, and she goes into a state of prayer and meditation, and uh, you know, she she is a completely transformed uh, person, both on the inside and the outside. So um, I really found uh, this story so beautiful. Um, to mention over here today because we are in a state of toiling and the, the veils of the heart do not open without going through this toil. And the veils of the heart and the answers to the soul do not come until we have seen the darkness, until we have been broken so many times. Um, and you know how uh, Rumi says that where there is, uh, no, Alif Shafak actually quotes this, uh, says this in her book. She says, where there is love, there is bound to be heartbreak. And uh, the reason I quoted Alif Shafak here is because uh, Rumi is very pertinent here. And uh, when she says heartbreak, uh, Rumi says that pain is where the light enters. So when the heart breaks, there is pain. And when there is pain is when the light enters. And you see that again and again in Bibi Zulekha's life. And it's a journey of love. It's a journey of toiling and being in a state of cover, mm -hmm. right intention with moving in that right direction. But even, even if we say that, oh, well, Zulekha didn't have God in mind. Uh, initially, it was the Yusuf she was desiring. Uh, we see now this ayat of Hazrat uh, Surah Yusuf where Allah is saying, Wallahu ghalibu ala amrihi. It was Allah who was taking her and guiding her in that direction. Even though her intention may not have been sorted out right in the start. Even though for her it was just a very, uh, you know, worldly desire to desire a man who was so beautiful. But for Allah, the plan, the bigger plan was always in place. He was guiding her through her lower desires into desiring something so great that we can only feel envious for. That she was able to, uh, to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's proximity through the Prophet of God, to go through that alchemy, to go, to go through that transformation um, that completely changed her. So, wallahu ghalibu ala amri power. Uh, point of discussion today. So now when we look at Surah Fatiha and we start from uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, we start by saying that, okay, Allah, uh, you know, embrace, embrace, uh, you know, I'm embracing, you are embracing me in your mercy. Um, and I also wanted to mention something here. One of my friends brought it to my attention um, that uh, the, the one of the, one of her teachers who was discussing Bismillah said that the, the, the preposition be in the Bismillah is uh, according to that teacher, her teacher uh, is not with, uh, in, with, with the name of Allah. Um, it is only in the name of Allah. Check, um, I don't want to make a mistake. So I'll just read that out a little bit. Um, yeah, that, uh, so usually uh, it, it means it and not in the name of Allah, uh, uh, the name of the one that bewilders the rational mind, the extremely merciful, the infinitely merciful. 
the teacher says that when we say in the name, it is taken from the style in other scriptures and is in the correct translation. So when we take the to mean with, it is as if uh, I were to say, I am writing with the pen. So if there was no pen, I would not be writing. Same way when we say, I begin with the name of Allah, it actually means that without him, without Allah, I am nothing. It is because he is there that I am also. So, so this is actually Tawheed, right? This is actually Tawheed. And, and the teacher tried to clarify that. Don't go with the translation in, but go with in. And it's a beautiful perspective. And we should uh, always uh, respect different perspectives and share and learn and, and never be shy of correcting ourselves. So uh, I really loved it because that is the reality. Um, uh, you know, I remember a story from Imam Ali Raza's time where a man came to challenge him and he said that, um, pray to Allah that uh, he takes his mercy away from me and then I'll see. And he said, look, let, don't let me pray this because uh, it won't serve you anything. And that man immediately died because we are really a thing. Mercy is all there is. Um, so this is a story that I'm just sharing, uh, which I just remembered now. So I hope that my references are okay. Uh, with, with Surah Fatiha then, if we move ahead, we begin with Allah's mercy, which always surrounds us and because of which we are, there is existence um, in the name, with the name of Allah, who is uh, all kind and merciful. We go to the first ayah of uh, Surah Fatiha, uh, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So uh, we had discussed praise and we said that praise is only for Allah. And we said that um, we can only praise that whom we know, right? And so uh, we, we are praising Alhamdulillah, uh, Rabbil Alameen. Um, Rab, Rab we had discussed is the one who nourishes us and helps us grow. Um, I want to discuss also, uh, Rab, if we have time today. So we still have time. So I will go back to uh, Rab. I will also go back to the idea of toiling uh, and the trials and tests in life. Uh, after I finish uh, this fast, uh, you know, going through Surah Fatiha fast, because um, every time I try to do it, it goes to the end of the class and then it doesn't happen. So, um, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is saying, all praise, there is nothing but praise for Allah whenever we open our mouth, whenever there is beauty, wherever there is appreciation, whether we like it or we don't, existentially, the praise only belongs to Him because there is only Him. Um, Rabbil Alameen, now Alameen is for me in my understanding which i'm sharing with you today is the inner worlds and the outer worlds mental psychological spiritual physical these are our worlds because if we just uh, go into the whole cosmology and we say well there are worlds away from us and galaxies and suns and all of that it's fine um there's a whole discussion in philosophy about uh you know whether the sun is the center or the earth is the center and all of those discussions are well and good, but for me to enter my salah, which I probably do with my kids and cooking and or whatever, like men are at work and they want to do their namaz, sometimes even quickly, um, I can't go into those discussions when I'm doing my alham four times in my zohar salah, right? So there has to be a faster, uh, you know, shot, you know, like fast food. So like there has to be a faster way of absorbing something from Surah Fatiha that can transform me. And that's what I'm getting after right now. Uh, and so when I say Alameen, I want to talk about my words, my spiritual world, my psychological world, my mental state when I enter uh, so the, the, the mihrab of my salah. So Alameen is saying my words and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Rabb. He's the nourisher of my word. So when I enter my salah, I am saying, Praise is for the God, for the Lord, who is the nourisher and the helper of, of my inner worlds and my outer worlds. You know, he's the one that if I'm stressed, if I'm in anxiety, if I'm going through panic, he is the one who is nourishing my inner world as well. Then uh, when we talk about uh, the inner worlds, then uh, again, uh, Allah says, Ar-Rahman Rahim. 
So now we talked about those who open their heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when you open your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there will be fear because now you're entering the spontaneous world where you're not being calculated and Allah is saying ar rahman ar rahim again to remind you look I'm not only your nourisher in your inner world where there is panic or or anxiety or depression or whatever but I'm also Rahman and Rahim and he's emphasizing it again so now your inner worlds are being enveloped with this special mercy and a common mercy with us that Rahman is for as a common mercy for all states all you know creatures everyone but Rahim is that special mercy which is for the one who opens his heart so Allah is saying that for the special work that you are doing the special kabad and suffering that you are facing me to come to me then i am rahim i am also seeing to it that you are striving and my special mercy is enveloping you right then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says maliki yawmiddin now you know the malik is in in a very generic way the master right so we say master of the day of judgment but yawm can mean moment a fraction of time and deen is the uh, moment of judgment so we say day of judgment but what i am inferring here is he is the master of our of the moment of accountability within our inner worlds the master of the moment of accountability within our inner worlds and the moment of accountability is in every moment so he is our master of accountability in every moment and in every moment we have the choice of whether we accept him as the master or not right and therefore allah is saying malik yawmiddin so he is saying that he is the master now how much do i accept it so last time when session uh, we discussed two stages of tawakkul in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first was that allah gives us the choice and he says that you know there is certain things that are predetermined but then but then i give you the freedom right uh, in matters of azab and in matters of uh, that question of azab that we were discussing we said that there is there is allah who is saying that if you choose misguidance then i will give it to you as the free will you can exercise so in this moment also in this discussion also maliki yawmiddin also we also have that choice it, we can have a choice and say i want some power over my moment of accountability in this moment so somebody triggers me somebody attacks me um, you know somebody takes away my right in that moment i can be the one saying well i want to go fight for my right uh, i want to do this xyz um allah has given me the free will i can reply back i can misbehave or i wouldn't uh, so we have that and we talk about so much we talk so much about taking pauses right through mindful actions and through zikr so um you know we can do that and we can say well i have that partial will and i would like to exercise it in a certain way um but then then there is that stage where you say that allah ghalib ala amri you know he is the one predominant over my affairs so in this moment whether i'm confused or angry or um you know um riled up or anything like that and and confused maybe maybe i don't i can't find the wisdom in the situation then i can say allah ghalib ala amri and leave it to him right in that maliki yawmiddin that we do decide to make him that master and over here i want to share an experience that i personally had um that um i had a teacher and uh, i didn't realize that i was having a very uh you know self absorbed discussion where instead of uh, listening from the teacher um i was quite bent upon teaching him uh, very sadly my point of view and i was quite adamant um and uh, the the teacher i was speaking to was a very learned and very godly person he could he could see my my uh, you know stubbornness and and we were having discussions on quran 
And uh, he told me that you're not listening to me. And uh, I became quiet. And uh, his energy was so effective uh, that when I came home, um, I felt like something was really uh, affected, you know, by what he had said. It usually happens when we're stubborn or we're, we're too self-absorbed. And then, you know, somebody points something out to us. Ego either goes into a defense mode or it can surrender and say, ah, this is a moment for me to surrender and learn. And um, I actually uh, felt it as a very strong blow because some teachers have that effect. Um, and in that moment, I felt like God was the Maliki Yomidi, you know, like um, he was, he had created an effect uh, in that moment where, where he made me accountable to myself, which was not in my hands. I would not have uh, seen it coming that way. I would not have uh, been able to submit if it were not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating that submission within me. And so, you know, there was this, uh, there was this partial, you know, asking Allah to help. Uh, and there was a partial um, wanting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to mediate and come within. And there was a partial exercising of free will also in that moment because of the stubbornness and all of that. But then later on, I realized that, um, you know, when we, we, if we could, and if we could, you know, train ourselves, and if Allah wills it, and we really, you know, remember that he is the Maliki Omidin in every moment, that inshallah, we wouldn't have that stubbornness. We wouldn't have to, you know, I mean, we wouldn't be exercising that kind of free will that can take away take us away from that opportunity to go and learn and to break out of that shit of ego. So I hope I am making sense, but um, I wanted to share how Maliki Yomidin can, can affect us by Allah becoming the pre one in our affairs. And then, um, so uh, if we read about Zen and if we read about the, you know, Zen philosophies and Buddhist philosophies about non-resistance, right? Um, and when we talk about non-resistance, it's like um, uh, surrender, 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 which is what we were just talking about, surrendering. Um, if we move out of that place, inshallah, with Allah's help, that we say, well, Allah, I am flawed. I don't feel like using my free will and I want you to be the one uh, deciding my affairs. Then we enter that space of non-resistance. Then instead of us uh, having any say in the way life flows, the way Buddha says, don't go with the flow, become the flow. And so we, we, we don't say, okay, I would like to go with what God has decided, but we say, now I'm not there. I don't exist. I don't, I don't want to even be a participant in making any decisions because how could I ever compete? How can I ever compete with God's wisdom? How can I ever compete with his amazingly perfect plan? It can never be possible. So, um, so, so now moving forward, uh, the mindset becomes of non-resistance. I don't want to get in my own way, right? And then uh, when we say um, we're actually saying that I comes from Abd and we say I surrender Abd, servant, like we discussed in the beginning, Abdul Rahman, right? We still have to go back to that discussion on Abdul Rahman. And so we surrender, I surrender to you, Ya Allah. I, 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 I surrender to you. We surrender to you. Um, and we'll go into the discussion of the usage of na'abudu here in, instead of a'abudu because it's a plural. Uh, we'll do this later. But for now, it's a state of submission. It's a state of completely saying, well, uh, I accept your decree and I, want to, I am your servant, I'm your abd and I'm in complete surrender, and I'm in complete state of non-resistance, right? Um, so whatever you want now, Ya Allah, you work through me. And for that too, I ask for help uh, from you. I ask your help because this, this desire that I have 
uh, of uh, wanting to be in a state of non-resistance and this desire that I have where I become an abd, a true servant who is completely surrendered, I can't do it. Uh, it's not in my hand. It's so difficult. I can't do it. So I ask for your help. Keep me in this state. We all know uh, who've been practicing mindfulness and meditation and all these things. We all know how difficult it is to stay in that state and how easily we keep falling out of our mindful states. And that is the state of Sirat Mustaqim. You know, they, they always taught us uh, from a very young age that Sirat Mustaqim is a bridge which is thinner than hair and sharper than sword and stuff like that. And, and that's how I feel when we're trying to practice mindfulness, how easy it is to fall off how easy it is to break off from that connectedness. Um, and so we are asking Allah, keep me on the path of mustaqim, keep me, keep me uh, steadfast on this path uh, of being mindful, of being connected to your presence constantly and to this state of surrender. Because so often we say we, we enter a meeting or we enter a dialogue or we enter a you know, uh, a hot situation and we're like, oh, I'm going to be really surrendered and I'm, I'm going to be like calm, you know, and I'm going to be like this. And then how easily something triggers us and we just blow off, right? We just lose our calm. So we, we ask Allah to keep us on that path of surrender, of non-resistance, you know, and of not going with the flow, but actually being the flow. Uh, so uh, that was uh, Sirat Mustaqim, Sirat al Ladina and Amta Alayhim, those who received uh, the gift. Now, um, for me, for some time now, the most beautiful gift that Allah can ever give us would be uh, Kosar, right? That abundance that Allah talks about uh, in Surah Qasr. And, uh, you know, um, a lot of mystics have spoken about. Um, Qasr, what Qasr is, uh, in my, in my uh, you know, uh, understanding, uh, just my opinion, uh, not, this is not a fact or taken from anywhere, um, it's that inner calm and peace uh, of trust and love that Ibrahim felt for Allah when he jumped into the fire. Um, and I, I very much feel that the, the coldness of that fire uh, could actually very well mean that on a human level, the fear that we experience that can be expressed as fire turned cool into that coolness of love. So fear turned into faith, fear turned into love. And for me, that sounds like the biggest gift that we could ever have. Why? Because... Uh, Qasr is this unending river, right? And, um, uh, you know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it is, the, it is the progeny of the Prophet that has been blessed with the Qasr and the others haven't, then, uh, you know, spiritually we are children of the Prophet. And the gift that Prophet has to give us through his uh, Usfatul Hasana. Uh, is that gift of contentment, is that gift of everlasting peace, everlasting abundance of serenity and tawakkul and, and trust in Allah's plan so that we never feel, uh, um, you know, agitated or we never feel out of place uh, in our life because everything is Allah's, is dominated by Allah. Everything, the, there is only Allah's will. Uh, you know, and, and we want to enter that realm of doing life where there is, honestly, uh, we out of our own free will give up our will. So we, we out of our own free will, uh, we give up our free will and to say, Allah, I want only your will. And you see how, uh, how uh, subtle these ideas are, because if I'm using my free will to get Allah's will, I'm still practicing my free will. So it's so beautiful how uh, Allah has, uh, you know, planned our existence and the subtle levels. And so, so you know, that's the, the infinite gift, uh, the gift of surrender. If I can enter the state of taslim, then that would be an amta alayhim, um, which is what we see in, in the lives of the awliya Allah. And غير المغروب عليهم not those who got, got lost in this terrain and lost 
their way, um, you know, in their intention and got lost in their uh, gifts, you know. So, so I'm not doing a literal translation here or anything, but this is just how I, uh, you know, absorb these meanings when I try to do salah and to understand that, you know, the ones who were the opposite of getting the gift were the people who could not be in a state of surrender. You know, don't don't make me one of those who cannot appreciate the gift of surrender. You know, because ego keeps getting in the way, and um, uh, surrender uh, is something that ego does not allow. Uh, and so, a lot of times, surrender, the word surrender, becomes a very huge trigger point for a lot of us because uh, it makes us feel helpless. It makes us feel like we're being dominated. It makes us feel like I'm not in control. I'm not in power. Um, but over here, we're talking about the kings of the kings, right? The, the most wise, the most, most loving. Um, and so that's what love does, right? It, it uh, takes away the self, you know? Love takes away the self. Love actually wants us to want to sacrifice in the name of love. Um, there is no greater power uh, than, than the power of love. So that was uh, Surah Fatiha that I wanted to do briefly. And then I wanted to go back to, uh, you know, um, uh, this uh, uh, discussion that we were having. And I wanted to discuss about the state of Kabad. And uh, Rumi says that, um, let me just quote him. He says, if you are irritated by every rub, how will your mirror be polished? So, you know, uh, these rubs that come in life in the form of calamities and turmoils and pain, um, if we keep getting annoyed by them all the time, then, uh, and we don't want them, for example, and we say, well, I want these pains to go away, then they actually come to, to shine at, at us, you know, to take that rust off our hearts uh, and to open the veils so we can witness the beloved. So um, now I'm quoting from uh, uh, Secrets of Divine Love by uh, Ariza Helwa, and I want to talk about how life is a test. And um, uh, first she's discussing about the idea of um, moving towards perfection and love like we discussed. And she says that since we tend to have an affinity toward the goodness of those we resemble, uh, the more we mirror God, the more our love of God blossoms. So the more we accompany those who love God and reflect God's qualities of kindness, compassion, mercy, and peace, the more we are drawn into the oneness of his love. And that is why affinity with the Aima, with the prophets, with the imams is so beautiful and amazing because they have these qualities. And with their, uh, uh, with their love, uh, with their compassion, with their peace, uh, with their energy of kindness, uh, we can find oneness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are like the moon. The more we turn away from the darkness of the ignorant ego and toward the eternal light of God's love, the fuller our spirits become. Then she says, worship is the highest station of love. Um, how Allah's love both embraces and overlooks our greatest mistakes, we cannot help but worship him. Sincere worship is not born from the soil of obligation, but from gratitude. And therefore, gratitude is, again, free will. Allah says, like Rahafidin, there is no compulsion in religion. And so, um, you know, there is this submission that comes in the heart out of love. You can't make anyone love, and you can't take love away. And when love enters the heart with the will of Allah, you know, even in the Amr of love, when Allah puts love in our heart, then there is sincerity. And that sincerity is sincerity because sincerity means that you do not want anything else in return. You become the one who wants no reward for what you are giving, for what you're sacrificing. And that is why the highest states that the mystics ever reach is the state of Fana the state of annihilation, because as long as I'm saying, oh, I'm doing this so that I get God, I still haven't reached Pana because I still exist. And I still have a transaction and I still want God in return. But the most sincere state would be where I don't exist and there is only Allah. And 
you know, it becomes a very poetic uh, way of expression, but, but that's how mystics say it. So then uh, when we turn our worries into worship through prayer, repentance, and remembrance of Allah's names, our awareness shifts from how big our problems are to how big our Lord is and we feel peace. Um, when we shift our perspective from what God is doing to us to what is God doing for us, we are able to see that although God may not always give us what we want, he will always give us exactly what we need. So, um, uh, you know, um, a lot of times we, we desire something, but our soul has a different plan and Allah is interested in the plan for the soul. Um, and in the Quran, in Surah number 2, Ayah 216, Allah Subhanahu Taala says, it may be that you hate something and it is good for you. And it may be that you love something that it is bad for you. God knows what soil your seedling soul needs to blossom. He gives you people to love you, to leave you, to inspire you, to doubt you, and to believe in you. Out of his love, God lets the world hurt you and break you, not because he wants to destroy you, but because he wants to show you your hidden strengths that can only be manifested in the cocoon of trials. If Allah wants to do good to somebody, he afflicts him with trials. She's quoted this hadith of the Holy Prophet. If Allah wants to do good to somebody, he afflicts him with trials. Um, and now uh, there's a little story that she explains. And at, and, and at this point, I would like to end today's session. She says that, um, you know, there's an Islamic teaching in the Quran where Allah says that verily with difficulty comes ease. Um, you know, Allah subhanahu ta'ala is always sending us uh, means and people in our lives that make, uh, you know, the name of the book Zahida, it's, uh, it's Secrets of Divine Love by A. Helva. So that's how she goes by on her book. Uh, A. Helva, H -E. I'll, I'll type it once I'm done. Um, Secrets of Divine Love. Uh, and I've been quoting this book throughout uh, our last few sessions also. Um, so, um, so the story goes like this, that a boy, uh, you know, sees a, sees a little moth uh, struggling to get out of the cocoon, the caterpillar who's growing and struggling to get out of the cocoon. And uh, say, he sees that this creature is struggling so much and is in so much pain. Uh, and he says, well, let me open the hole a little bit so that I can easily come out. I can't see it in pain. And so he does, and he opens it, and the moth comes out. But what he realizes is that that moth was never able to fly. And uh, the story here is saying that Allah has created a system for us to develop our faculties so that we can fly one day. And that comes through trials and tribulations. And this moth needed to squeeze through a tiny hole because it would re- uh, you know, I had read about it that it would um, realign the weight in the body and make it thinner uh, so that the moth would be able to fly. But because it didn't go through that passage, you know, uh, it could never fly because its body always stayed heavy on one side. It couldn't, it couldn't fly. And so we, you know, that boy who was actually trying to do good did harm. And when Allah doesn't, uh, you know, make some things easy or make them go away sometimes when we really, really desperately want them to go away, it's because we're going through that passage of um, that process where we, we are learning to uh, get, get into the next stage where he, Allah knows that this is what we are, we, our soul needs to fly one day. So uh, when we face trials, we are being prepared to manifest our greatest potential. Um, and I would like to end with this beautiful uh, analogy that she gives. And she says, we are like photographs. Our faith is developed in the dark room of trials we face. So Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, um, I would like to ideally keep this time for question and answer. So uh, I will make a dua and then I will stop the recording so that if anyone wants to... Um, uh, you know, uh, ask any questions or you know, participate in the discussion, share some ideas. Uh, that would be really lovely. As always, I really, um, 
really appreciate when I learn from you all. Um, uh, yes, I have this message in the chat, which is saying trials teach us sometimes. Sometimes it gets harder during the trial. You know, of course, and I, I, I can't, I can't, uh, you know, agree with you more. It gets so hard. Um, but they say, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, um, so the, the idea is that we, 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 you know, we remember these analogies that we're sharing today. Uh, and you know Hazrat Yusuf himself like he was thrown in the well and then he was taken away as a slave and then he was put in the dungeon and it was all done very unfairly because he didn't deserve it right like he, he wasn't a criminal that he, he needed to be in the prison uh, uh, you know um, and uh, so we, one could argue that it was so unfair it was so unfair but that is what made him who he was Allah was Allah was sculpting him the whole time. Uh, I also have a message that what is there if there is no trial? Um, so, you know, yeah, like what is there? Like you go to school and imagine there are no tests, no exams, then how do you get promoted? So I, I understand that some schools in Finland are finding a different way. Let's see how that goes. Um, that is besides the point. Um, yeah, if things are always going good, Rumi says that if there are no opposites, you won't have any value, right? And I want to I wanna share one thing here. Um, thank you for this chat because it's reminded me of something really uh, amazing. Um, you know, I heard one scholar say that Allah's names are always manifesting, right? So uh, if Allah is al-Shafi and that's his quality, uh, then how is the shifa going to manifest itself if there was no disease? So imagine our, you know, our beautiful uh, youth, they go to, um, they go through medical school and they come out of there becoming doctors, but there's nobody sick. They won't be able to manifest their quality of healing if there was nobody sick. And so there will be no value for shifa. There will be no um, understanding of what Shifa looks like. There will be no uh, witnessing of this uh, healing of uh, going through suffering and then valuing what health is. So uh, Allah, when he is manifesting his beautiful qualities, it needs that canvas where uh, if, if uh, you know, when, when, when we paint, we are taught that if you want to paint a white dress, uh, you can't paint it on a white canvas. You need a darker background to create that white uh, dress on top of it. So you can't, you can't see the beauty of white. You can't see the beauty of light if there was no background of darkness to it. Uh, so these are just analogies, and Rumi uses a lot of these opposite analogies to uh, understand why there is good and bad and trials in life. Uh, I have a question in the chat here. How do we know whether to surrender to a situation or not? What's the difference between surrendering and remaining passive in a situation? Uh, thank you so much for bringing in this question. Um, I think that the answer to this question has evolved for me. Um, and uh, I think that the first answer for this would be that um, uh, we as human beings are a uh, mumbo jumbo of a lot of emotions and a lot of inner and outer turmoil and states. So um, my answer to this is that if uh, a particular situation where you want to do good, but you do not find in yourself to do that good without creating a mess within, without, as in if you go and do good for somebody, uh, or if you surrender, then it will create resentment, hatred, uh, negativity. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of internal, you know, gunk. Then it's better to say no and say I can't do it, right? Because we are not. You know, uh, Rasulullah said that you know uh, your actions depend on your intentions, and Allah says that are you one of those who forgets the hereafter for this world? So, so for me, that is an answer that you don't prioritize the world and what you're doing in the world and what you need to do in the world. If your inner world, for me hereafter, is always the inner world. 
uh, and the inner world is what we're going to be taking to the actual barzakh and the actual hereafter. There's a barzakh here and there's a barzakh there and that's another discussion. But for me, the hereafter is, a, is, is nurturing and caring for the inner world. And if there is gunk in the inner world, then what good is the outer action? If you're doing it and saying, oh, I want to be a good person and I want to surrender and I want to get close to Allah, but inside my heart, I'm filling it up with all kinds of hatred and resentment and you know um, and then it's so much that either it makes me sick or uh, I go and I, I gossip about that situation like oh my god it was so hard uh, you know certain guests came over to my house and they did this and they did that and you know I couldn't say no so I just said this, I just did, did, did this and they were so horrible and that's gossiping and that's creating an internal world of dirt so instead of putting your Instead of that, if we could find the courage and have that faith and say, I can, I'm sorry, um, it's, too, it's too difficult for me, and just be really vulnerable and honest and say, you know, I really, do, I'm not up to this, I can't do it, uh, and I don't want to hold any resentment for you, then that would be the first thing. And then with the will of Allah, inshallah, one day if we can, then we, I, I personally would like to surrender to all situations, all the time, uh, and just let God do his magic. You know, because uh, one of my teachers, he was saying that, um, you know, it's a principle that when you surrender for God, everyone returns to you. So it's a principle in life. When you surrender, then people come back and respect you and love you and do all of that. Well, it takes time. It takes patience. You have to go through that trial of surrender. And, and we're all in it. Like, I'm struggling with that myself. So eventually, there is only surrender that is the highest speed, right? Um, but before that, when we're, while we're not there yet, you know, um, one has to take care of their inner health first. Uh, and, and I think that's really, really important for, for most of us. Yeah, so I hope that answers the question, um, inshallah. And uh, I can now request you all to put up your hands for the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Oh Allah, we stand in front of you with with our broken selves, with our weak selves, with our struggling selves, trying to emulate your beauty, trying to emulate the Usatul Hasna of your beautiful Prophet and the Aima and the Imams and the Awliya Allah. Oh Allah, we surrender. We surrender ourselves to you and ask you to mold us and shape us and sculpture us. We give you our hearts, Ya Allah. It is all yours and may you make it only yours. Ya Allah, really, really, we need you. We really need you. We, we cannot do anything ourselves. We are so helpless. Oh Allah, bring healing to all those who are suffering. Bring healing to all those in disease. Bring healing to all those in pain, Ya Allah. Heal everyone with your love and kindness and mercy and give us the stamina of contentment and patience and sabr and jameel in any of the calamities to always remember that you're the hand that's at work. You're the one who is using us and making us into our better selves and taking us to our highest potential and perfection. Oh Allah, bring healing to this world in this uh, difficult, difficult situation with the coronavirus. Oh Allah, and as you work to heal the, our outer selves, uh, oh Allah, heal our inner selves and um, hasten the reappearance of our imam and make us one of his companions. I mean, Yes, we have a message in the chat for complete surrender. We need to learn detachments. Yes, um, absolutely. And uh, as you can see on the screen, we were discussing the story of Hazrat Yusuf and Bibi Zulekha, and um, she fell in love. And then until she wasn't completely detached from the, the, the material aspect of Yusuf, uh, that the enlightenment didn't come. When she had completely let go, that's when uh, the the enlightenment came. So yes, we have to detach ourselves from worldly attachments. Thank you so much for all of your beautiful messages, your support, your presence, uh, the energy that you bring to the sessions is phenomenal. I always feel energized and uh, rejuvenated after doing these sessions. Um, and uh, in fact, a lot of your energy actually helps to bring out a lot that I haven't even planned to uh, discussing the sessions, but it comes out, and, and I'm really grateful to all of you for that. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Kadafis.
Thank you, everyone.